Hi, Yipeng. Good evening. How are you? All good? Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, uh, everyone, for joining. And I see uh, people are continuing to join. Uh, so we'll give everybody another minute or two, and then uh, we'll get started. Uh, yeah. So uh, thanks for joining us at, at this hour uh, from uh, London. How, how's the weather out there? How's the winter? Yeah. The weather is, is is kind, really. So yeah, 10, 10, 10 degrees. I think you can't complain. Yeah, no complaints. 10 Celsius, right? So you guys are off in yeah, early. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Just to be clear to the, you know, to those to those of us who it's still uh, the middle of their working day. Okay, so uh, yeah, we'll get started. I'll give give a brief intro, and then we'll move into the lecture. So uh, thanks everybody uh, for joining again. This is the RSAP Vision uh, Meetup today. We have uh, Yipeng Hu, Associate Professor of UCL, who will talk about uh, a clinical use of in uh, of ML in ultrasound guided surgery. Uh, we have these uh, webinars uh, uh, more, more or less once uh, every other month. Uh, we try to invite uh, leading researchers uh, from different uh, medical uh, computer vision and medical AI fields uh, to talk about their work. Uh, and uh, you know, we uh, try to invite you guys uh, uh, at the audience uh, who have uh, uh, specific interests uh, in these uh, specific topics. Uh, a bit about us. Uh, so my name is Moshe. I'm from RSIP Vision. Uh, we're an a AI and computer vision a company, 60-person company out of Israel, uh, been around for about 25 years, and uh, our specialty is basically creating uh, customized software uh, for analysis and interpretation of medical images, uh, both on the planning side, uh, for instance, uh, segmenting a, a multi-phase CT scan in a kidney uh, for the various organs to support uh, uh, planning of procedures, uh, also intra-procedural guidance, so here uh, you guys can see uh, a solution we're working on uh, for registering drop ultrasound uh, to the pre-op data and registering that to the intra-op video feed, uh, and also analytics uh, behind that, so, uh, uh, what people are calling uh, uh, ML or uh, predictive analytics uh, for medical use cases, which I think is a, a really exciting and interesting uh, up-and-coming field uh, beyond uh, uh, the uh, you know CV and, and image processing and uh, intra-op uh, capabilities, and we work with the medtech industry. Uh, to uh, you know, uh, provide enabling technologies for various medical devices. Uh, we try to you know be at uh, the main conferences. So in surgical, we were at the Sages uh, Innovation Weekend, if you know, at Hamlin Symposium, where I met uh, uh, some of Yipeng's colleagues. Uh, and uh, we try to stay uh, uh, you know uh, in contact with the academic world and learn uh, about uh, uh, all the new research that's being done. And uh, this webinar is uh, part of that and part of our connection to the. A general community of ecosystem, uh, both of uh, the medical community uh, and uh, academia and uh, uh, industry, uh, really uh, to just help uh, share uh, the knowledge uh, that's being generated and the experience that's being gained uh, in the various uh, uh, fields and the various places and parts of the community. Uh, so, uh, uh, Yipeng, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it sounds like you're going to be talking about, uh, uh, you know, these uh, uh, AI technologies, but in a wide variety of fields. So uh, Yipeng does research in medical image computing and apply, applied ML for interventional and surgical sciences across uh, different clinical fields, including obstetric, or urology, uh, and gastro. Uh, yeah, pleasure to have you here. And uh, I will pass the presentation on to you. Uh, the audience, by the way, uh, you guys, there's a place uh, uh, in the GUI of uh, GoToWebinar where you can write in your questions. Uh, so if, uh, you know, uh, Yipeng is talking about a particular topic and you get curious about something, you want to ask something, uh, please type in the questions into the question box and then uh, at the end of the, the talk, uh, we'll have about 10 minutes uh, for some Q&A and some discussion. Uh, all right, here we go. All right. Let me just... Uh... Can you can you see my screen the the presentation yeah. info screen? It's good, yeah. Uh, yeah, good to uh, hello everyone. Uh, um, so my name, as I introduced, my name is Ipan. I'm a researcher at a, a University College of London. So uh, I'm uh, 
sorry, but it's a bit messy on my screen at the moment. <laughs> uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, research topics, uh, largely the research done in our own group, uh, which is applying machine learning in ultrasound guided surgery and interventions. So our group is uh, called Candy. It's a relatively uh, new group, although we have been in the in the field for for 15 years. Uh, but uh, this group is led by myself and uh, Professor Dean Barrett. And now we have uh, somewhere between 15, 20 people. We are also part of the Welcome and EPRC, EPSRC Center for uh, uh, Interventional and Surgical Sciences, and also part of Center for Medical Image Computing, both uh, research centers at University College in London. So uh, again, so today we, what I'm trying to do really is to use some of the, uh, share some of the experience and the examples uh, uh, of those research work down in our group. So as you can see in this uh, rather uh, messy content page, uh, where you can see I'm gonna cover some of the supervised learning, physics informed neural networks, and the meta-learning was a big thing in our group last year, and a bit of a reinforcement learning and uh, sequential modeling as well. So mainly, I we'll, will I'll, I'll discuss three applications. I would call it a prostate, uh, liver, and uh, uh, fetal uh, sort of uh, applications. So when I get to there, we'll talk about, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a bit more details about those applications. So in terms of the clinical or uh, computational task, we're gonna look at localization, essentially segmentation, registration, skill assessment, and image quality uh, assessment. Now, the first application I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, transrectal ultrasound guided procedures. As you can see on the left hand side, the patient will be uh, lying down and ultrasound probe. Uh, can you see my mouse cursor? No? Just a minute. Which one are you pointing at now? Yeah, just I'm just trying to see yeah, whether you can see my mouse. Let me. Yeah, you're free up MR. Yeah, it's good. Uh, is it better? Even better. Yeah. Okay. So, so as but I yeah sorry this is a new software to me so I'm trying to now I can't get rid of that window. Sorry, there is a big window of both of us in front of my slides now. So I can't see my own slides. Is that a way I can? Can you move it to another screen? Uh, okay, here we go. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so as you can see on the left, the most left figure, uh, so the ultrasound proof is uh, inserted from your back pass, placed underneath the prostate gland, so you can actually see the images, uh, uh, ultrasound images, uh, 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 of the prostate uh, um, axial view or the uh, uh, sagittal view here. So uh, the needles will go through a, something called a template with a relatively fixed position to the ultrasound probe. So this template will be used to guide, together with ultrasound images, to guide where you should place your needle. So now we mainly talk about the biopsies, but the, exactly the same setup can be used for focal therapy as well. So we are treating a specific position of the prostate gland rather than the entire gland. So one of the key things uh, uh, as part of my PhD 20 years ago really is uh, uh, was that uh, uh, on your right hand side you can see a preoperative MR images. This is a T2, but we usually would use more sequences and we can find a lesion or a suspected cancer as indicated in the wrap here on the MR images. However, in the ultrasound images, uh, the, the tissue contrast is just not there. So you can't really see the cancer. So one of the tasks that I had in my PhD is to do an image registration such that uh, registering the transrectal ultrasound images, which is used to guide the procedure and the preoperative MR images where you can see the cancer. So once the image is registered, you can uh, really get all the information from the preoperative images, such as the cancer locations to the transrectal ultrasound images, bring those information into your procedure, into your surgery, so you can actually target those lesions. Uh, 
So second application I'm going to talk about is a lap laparoscopic liver resection. So Professor Matt Clarkson is one of my colleagues at UCL uh, who has been working on this project again for, the, for, for a good more than a decade now. And uh, on the, so on the right hand side, this is a comparison between a laparoscopic uh, uh, surgery. So sometimes it's called keyhole surgery where you really just need a small, uh, a couple of, usually two, a couple of small holes. So uh, to do a liver re resection in this particular case compared to an open surgery on your right hand side where you need a very large incision, uh, which has an uh, increased chance of uh, uh, infection, for instance. Uh, because of uh, the, 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 the small access point really restricted in the surgeon's view. So the imaging becomes very important. Mainly we use the two imaging modalities to help to guide the surgery as uh, shown on the left hand side. Uh, this picture here is the camera, basically a video feed. And uh, on the right uh, is the ultrasound images. So where you can see beyond the surface of the organ, as you can see here is a cross-sectional view of a liver where you can see uh, some of those dots, I think is the, uh, um, is, is the vessel. Right, so these are the two sort of applications I would, I would call prostate example and the liver application uh, going forward. Uh, one of the things that deep neural network are very good at is to do segmentations. So on your left hand side, helped by one of our group, uh, uh, helped by one of my PhD students, Yanni, who's uh, uh, worked together with, with the colleagues at uh, Stanford. We did an external uh, validation, trying to really trying to see uh, those neural networks, whether their generalization ability can be across different data from different institutions and different modalities. So we, we, we tested the, uh, the segmentation accuracy, trained from images reconstructed from transverse views to those images acquired uh, from a, a, a sagittal rotated uh, rotations of reconstructed views. So that's the to human eyes, there's a big difference, actually, with a little bit of, uh, you know, as few as 10 cases for refining, it actually works uh, uh, very well. So on the right hand side, uh, uh, Nina is a PhD student, uh, co-supervised by myself, by myself and Matt. So I've got that problem again. Uh, so we are looking at uh, trying to segment vessels which has a rich anatomical information can be used later on to register the intraoperative ultrasound images to the preoperative CT images in this case. So this is the automatic segmentation uh, algorithm developed uh, and validated by her and uh, uh, published in, in IJCAS a year ago. Arguably, a more interesting thing Nina did was that uh, rather than just uh, register a so-called traditional medical images uh, between preoperative CT images and the intraoperative ultrasound images, as you can see uh, those two here, she was trying to register all three together, including the video feed, which is uh, you know it's actually a projective geometry uh, quite different than uh, ultrasound and the CT. I'm not going to the details of the uh, and this uh, this work, but the idea really is trying to trying to use the data we have we have to simulate the ground truth, then formulate the problem as a uh, 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 supervised learning, basically predicting the relative positions between all those three modalities, and then uh, figure out a way trying to reduce the gap between the simulation. Uh, generated model and uh, uh, what uh, what's the data will what data you're going to get in a real world application. So that's what I would call a tri model uh, image registration problem. Right. So the third application, uh, which you will see a couple of times later on, is the fetal anomaly examination. So this is done when I uh, when I was visiting Oxford, working with Professor Alison Noble. Uh, she has been working with this application for decades. 
So every pregnant woman will go through uh, ultrasound examinations at least twice, uh, sometimes three times in the UK, and a, a, a variable number of times in, in other parts of the world. So uh, the sonographer in this case uh, will use the ultrasound probe uh, to scan the pregnant woman's tummy and trying to do a number of measurements uh, to see whether you know the baby is is healthy and is there anything we need to worry about so this is uh, uh is this you know strictly speaking it's not an intervention or surgery but it is uh, using ultrasound to do clinical measurement and uh, also uh, don't forget it's also a guidance tool when you try to find the key and anatomical uh, and planes and uh, um, regions where you want to take those important measurements this is a phantom on your right hand side uh, where one of our trainee radiographers, uh, then trainee radiographers, uh, sorry, uh, 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 doctors really, uh, and uh, she's helping us doing some phantom studies. As you can see, uh, one of the reasons why we're trying to do those usability study is because this, uh, uh, this application operating using ultrasound images is very much skill and experience based. Uh, the difference, some, some of the radiographers can, can take years to get to the level uh, where you can do an efficient and effective uh, uh, diagnosis. So one important application in this area is really trying to find a way how to measure the skill of the operator. If you can measure, if you can measure it very uh, efficiently and effectively, then uh, there might be a better, more uh, operator-specific training program can be can be uh, uh, developed. So so far, most of the skill assessment is based on, I would say, subjective uh, and uh, and non-quantitative non -quantitative measurement. So, for instance. Uh, uh, the speed, the completeness of the task, or the years of experience. So what we are trying to do really is to see, trying to really redefine the criteria of uh, what a skill is. So especially in the era where we now have lots of machine learning models trying to help us to do some of the downstream tasks. For instance, uh, this is an example where we're trying to measure the uh, uh, a circumference of a head, uh, trying to uh, first to find a so-called standard plane, then measure the circumference of the head of the baby. So that measurement is very indicative of a number of disease uh, diseases. Uh, so that task can almost be automated by modern neural networks now. So now we're thinking, whether we can still use, apply the same skill criteria we used for decades to judge whether that operator, that radiographer had a good scan such that this measurement can be accurately obtained by machine learning models. Uh, for this purpose, we did essentially what we're trying to uh, define the so-called uh, you know, the, the, the level of skills as the performance of the task. So if the images going through a task model, in this case, finding standard plane, if the task can be performed well, we think the images is uh, of good quality. And uh, therefore, the operator or the radiographer obtained that uh, images has a sufficient skill. If otherwise, you, uh, the skill should be low. So then we can train a second neural network, which will try to predict that task performance. Together, we also uh, in, uh, feed in, in addition to the images, some motion models acquired from my uh, uh, IMU uh, to try to give the model a bit more information how the operator is actually acting uh, during the procedure. So 
uh, in this particular case, you know, the, uh, um, the, the correction rate of the, uh, the classification problem here, whether this is a given frame or given sequence of frames, is a, a standard plane or contains a standard plane, will be used uh, as your ground truth for your skill assessment predictor, which itself is a neural network. Right, so an interesting results really is if you compare to the so-called traditional measurement of a skill, you know, years of experience or speed of the uh, procedure, the time spent on a particular cost, they are quite different. So now we're trying to be very careful to judge the difference between those two, the neural network, uh, 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 what neural network tests you and what we defined as a skill and those traditional uh, measurements. But at least it opens up a new direction where it's something we should be careful and look at uh, when we assess uh, a skill. And uh, many downstream applications should be affected as well. <coughs> Sorry. So let's go back to the uh, prostate application. So I said, uh, uh, it is trying to register ultrasound and MR images uh, together as one of the, it was my PhD project really, so uh, many years ago, and it's been researched by many, uh, uh, many research groups in the world, and uh, there are commercial products already implemented uh, uh, this registration multi, uh, sort of a cross modality registration method in, in, in imaging. Uh, and scanners, for instance. Uh, but one of the things we found is uh, it is very difficult to register MR to ultrasound images uh, because they share, they have a, a sparse and uh, unreliable corresponding features. So one thing to address this problem is to have a strong and a realistic constraints of the deformation, which is registration trying to predict or compute. So in my uh, in my years, we try to use biomechanical models. Uh, uh, so essentially, a bunch of uh, partial differential equations are solved by finite element uh, 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 methods, and it is you know slow and very computationally expensive. And uh, I ended up trying to use a statistical model to summarize those solutions so it can be run quickly uh, during the surgery, where. Now we have a po uh, Ming Zhe, the postdoc in our group. He uh, essentially tried to utilize the most recent development in physics informed neural networks. So, treating uh, the solving the partial differential equations as a feed forward, sorry, it's not feed forward, a forward problem, and uh, minimizing the differences uh, between the predicted boundary conditions and the estimated boundary conditions. So, the boundary conditions here is essentially a surface registration problem, which will be solved together simultaneously with this uh, uh, physics informed neural networks. Uh, then, the no, I said the boundary conditions, but uh, the, the, the physics informed neural networks will optimize uh, uh, trying to solve the constitutive equations and uh, the uh, equilibri equilibrium string, uh, 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 basically the string equations uh, uh, together as well as minimizing the elastic energy. So essentially, what is the physical, the neural network, the lower neural network, if you want, the lower part of the entire neural network is trying to give the image registration, which is the upper part of the network, uh, constraint which is uh, um, governed by the, um, by the solid mechanics. So uh, this, this, uh, he summarized his work in a recent publication, which is just accepted a couple of weeks ago in, in IPMI. Uh, so uh, if anyone's interested, I think there is a copy on archive now. You can have a look. There's a bit of a mess in it, but uh, the, the results are, are really interesting. We basically demonstrated we can use this uh, uh, without using any final element method, but uh, having that uh, uh, solid mechanics together with uh, uh, to constrain our image registration algorithms. Right, so before I go on, for those of you uh, less familiar with something called the meta learning, this is just one slide introduction. So hopefully you can 
uh, 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 catch up with what I'm going to talk about. Excuse me. <clears throat> so methylene essentially is is trying is is a uh, is a formulation of a problem where you're trying to learn to to learn. So second learn would be a typical machine learning uh, uh, task. So machine learning is really just trying to uh, uh, to predict something based on a parametric function f of x. Uh, so the input will be a x, output will be y. And so the a machine learning model can do or inference or testing is to, to predict a y given uh, optimized uh, model in, in terms of a parametric model, basically means the theta of that uh, uh, function is optimized. So a learning algorithm um, on, the, on the other hand is trying to train such a model, optimize such a model. So the input would be a training data set, which have many pairs of those examples of the input and output X and Y respectively. And the output will be the parameters or the optimized parameter of that function F of, of, F of X. So really what we're after is the theta, which is the parameters of this function. Uh, by optimizing some of the, uh, uh, you know, the, your designed loss functions, and uh, you can argue it's uh, the the true goal is actually maximize the generalization on the independent test data set, uh, which is separate from a training data set. So a meta learning algorithm really is the now you have a your input is a meta training set, which is a set of pairs of a train and a test set. So the output is something what we can call as a, in general as a hyperparameter or configuration of your learning algorithm. So usually they can be parameterized, but sometimes they are just different choices. So on the right hand side, this is a uh, example of a, a meta learning problem where you're trying to, uh, uh, try to do network architecture search where you have options you know whether you use this branch or not use this layer or not how many layers are you using etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so these things are being optimized usually in the so-called outer loop where the inner loop is trying to uh, optimize its uh, uh, you know the the uh, the intended task it could be a network for classification or or regression for instance so this is uh, can also be viewed as a bi-level optimization where uh, the the true goal is a maximize as maximizes the optimize the learning algorithm on the independent met test set okay so this is really just one page uh, sort of a uh, 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 attempt to introduction to meta learning so what we're trying to do use meta learning. i think it's a, it's a, it's a quite useful sort of a thinking way for a lot of practical problems so zach is one of our phd students and what he's trying to do is going back to the same registration problems but to trying to apply a meta learning problem to uh, something called an interactive image registration so when we try. We also spend quite a bit of time trying to formulate and define what interactive image registration is. Uh, so uh, we, we we give it a go, and uh, what we're trying to say is uh, we consider an interaction is adding or modifying some of the data. The data can the data can be labeled or not labeled. Obviously, it depends on the application. Uh, in the registration application, whether you have segmentation to drive it or you're using unsupervised just intensity based uh, uh, registration, that will have different permutations of uh, and uh, of those interaction and the different possibilities of the forms of the interaction. So in this particular case, interaction could be adding a few or ultrasound slides. You know, the patient might be moved, so the uh, added slides should have more recent information where the gland is moved. Or you can add a couple more points or segmentations, which will give you a better indication uh, where the regions for interest is during the intervention. So now each original registration between MI and the ultrasound can be considered as a met task. 
a single task. So in the inner loop of that match learning, you are really trying to optimize the original registration problem, where in the outer loop, every time you have that added or modified data interaction, so that basically the data after interaction, there will be a new task. So during training, you're really trying to figure out a way, trying to learn a neural network, which can be more easily to adapt it to the situation where the data is being you know, added or modified. Therefore, to accommodate that uh, uh, interaction. So that's what we call as uh, inter meta learning, using a meta learning trying to, 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 to deal with this interactive medical imaging registration problem. Uh, and so if anyone's interested, the paper we published in TMI uh, last year, and uh, 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 you, which is built on the previous work, uh, uh, and uh, also from, from that, uh, looking at image registration using partial interactive point set data. So this is uh, uh, a very interesting, one of my favorite work last, last year, really. We call it a meta registration. Uh, so the application really is trying to uh, register ultrasound images uh, from different patients. Uh, so we have uh, ongoing sort of a, a idea of trying to build a, a atlas, for instance, using ultrasound images uh, from prostate cancer patients. Uh, but this is a sort of a, a, a follow-up work for this. Uh, but in this work, what we're trying uh, to say is what's the best way trying uh, to register ultrasound to ultrasound. So we know register ultrasound to ultrasound is quite difficult because the ultrasound images uh, uh, is of a variable quality and also orientation, direction, and dependent, uh, dependent on the person, skills and experience as we discussed before. So what we found is using a learning-based method. So we only talk about unsupervised learning, unsupervised registration here. So the images is actually, uh, as so the loss function is actually similarity between the fixed image and the uh, per move, so warped image warped by the predicted transformation. So we try to see the what's the role of the neural network. As you can see, I put the same same sort of learning-based registration uh, uh, illustration, exactly the same two of them twice. So for the upper one, I would consider this is a, you know, a classical machine learning method where input is pairs of images and trying to optimize the neural network. So if the neural network works well, it predicts a transformation is good. The transformation can warp the moving images so the warped image should be similar to the fixed image. Therefore, for an unsupervised uh, registration algorithm, the image similarity measure can be used as a loss function or dissimilarity can be used as a loss function. So during training, you really you try to input a, a number, uh, a mini batches, mini batches of uh, uh, paired and moving and uh, fixed images, both are ultrasound here. So alternatively, if you ask people from you know, uh, two decades ago, working with classical iterative uh, images registration, neural network can also be considered as a transformation approximator. Transformation itself is a function. So what it does is to try to uh, optimize between a single pair of moving and fixed images, trying to predict a single DDF or transformation in general between those two images. The same network, the same training strategy can be used driven by image dissimilarity measure to do a so-called classical iterative uh, uh, registration. So this is not new. People have been discovering and using this for, for a while now. So is there a way you can combine those two? Because they are just very, very similar in terms of code. In terms of code, the only difference is the data loading uh, pipeline. So one way people already tried is to consider the second way, you know, optimizing between a single pair of image as a test time optimization. 
So you train a neural network with a, um, a population of data, and when you test on a new given pair of images, you run the neural network updates by its gradient from the loss a couple more times, trying to optimize it during test time. But we think that there might be a better way to do it by formulating the whole thing as a meta-learning, such that the single pair optimization becomes a meta task. So when there are multiple pairs of images, essentially you're trying to build a meta registration network where not only it will be optimizing uh, a population of registrations, but you are trying to do a better initialization so the network can uh, not just do inference, but also adapt to the given new pair where uh, 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 you can get a, hopefully an even better registration algorithm, uh, 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 a better transformation predicted. So uh, Zach did a quite comprehensive study and experiments we published in ASMUS last year uh, for this work. Uh, it's not one of those papers being rejected by main conference and Mikai and uh, sent it to a workshop because we that's when we just got the results. So uh, again, I personally quite like this work. So anyone's interested, you can see. So we did a show there is a substantial advantage you can gain from by uh, by formulating this uh, as a uh, meta learning uh, uh, algorithms. So uh, yeah, so just use this opportunity to give Asmus a bit of a shot as well. So we organized Asmus for three years. Now Imperial will be organizing this workshop. This is the only workshop for ultrasound image computing in Mikai. Anyone interested should, uh, should be checking this out. Right, so I, I think I'm gonna run it out of time. Be gonna be quicker. So uh, image quality assessment is very similar to the skill assessment uh, uh, we discussed before. Uh, we're basically trying to trying to argue that image quality is a task specific problem. So as you can see, this is this as an example where you have an artifact by traditional criteria, it's probably a bad quality image. However, if the task is not segmentation where those artifacts are actually affecting the boundaries of the gland, if it's just a classification problem, it should be very easy to do because we can see the gland very easily. Neural network should be doing the same thing. That's why we're trying to say, the image quality should be relevant and uh, in a way decided by the end uh, or downstream task, especially if this task is done by uh, a deep neural network nowadays. So a more interesting insight is, uh, so this is, uh, sorry, before that, these are the examples where you do have uh, uh, um, images that have variable qualities and they can be considered very differently if the downstream task is different for instance segmentation and the classification we are considering in this case. So an insight to this problem is if the if the image qualities criteria changes with the downstream task, so perhaps the neural network or the task predictor is trained on those images should be change it as well. Because for instance, if the application is to discard those images with less quality, perhaps, perhaps we should only train those tasks with sufficient quality images. The task could be performed better on that subset of data. So Shahir is one of our PhD students to come up with algorithms using reinforcement learning, uh, trying to optimize a neural network a controller in this case, predicting image quality assessment. And uh, uh, the task predictor here will be segmentation or classification will produce, uh, uh, so its performance will produce a reward, which will feed back to the controller, the reinforcement learning agent, essentially, uh, uh, trying to train the controller. And the controller's action is really trying to selecting the training data and see whether it's a good quality or not. Uh, it could be hard selection or soft selection, uh, both would work. 
So uh, I'm going to skip the slides very quickly, but this is really just showing you some of the examples where a controller thinks it's a good quality, where human disagrees, or sometimes they, they, they do agree. <laughs> right, so, uh, so again, the prostate application, uh, we're trying to find a way to use reinforcement learning to do uh, a, find a policy where you can you can place your needle so you can efficiently effectively hitting the given lesions in the same application but uh, in the sort of planning it could be interoperative planning as well uh, so what shani uh, sorry what yani did is uh, was really trying to model the entire procedure as a reinforcement learning environment where the actions is the uh, now quite intuitively, uh, where to place your needle, where to move the ultrasound slides here. So you can have a better view of different parts of the gland and different parts of the, the lesion. And so that will be your observed state for your uh, reinforcement, learned, reinforcement uh, learning agent uh, trying to, uh, 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 so the action will be both moving your ultrasound probes and uh, um, where they fire the, the biopsy needle in this case. Uh, so trained with a single patient, it could be a patient specific uh, environment, it could be a population of a patient's environment. So it will come up a, a, a optimal policy where you should place your needles. Now, a very interesting result very quickly on the right hand side is actually the Reinforcement, the learned reinforcement learning agent is suggested. Given a very small lesion, you should spread your needle more rather than concentrate on the observed lesion because the observed lesion could have error because of the limited registration, because of uh, uh, among other things. So this seems counterintuitive because we always think if it's a small region, we should just hit in the center. But uh, the reinforcement learning actually suggests otherwise and actually get got a better accurate uh, hit rate so i'm not uh, i'm going to stop here because it's uh, it's already time this is one of the interesting results we sort of hope the reinforcement learning can come up with which uh, a bit different than what we we normally uh, 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 do i'm going to leave you with my last application which is a recent work from uh, chi uh, one of the, you know, when, uh, already published in this year's ISPI, the other one is under, uh, under revision in IPCAI, and we are looking at uh, uh, to do basically trackless ultrasound reconstruction, and in particular to model those sequences of frames as the sequential data properly, and looking into the role and long-term dependency, which is a big problem in natural language processing, uh, and, but in this application. So anyway, interested, uh, you should be uh, looking forward. Hopefully that will go through and uh, uh, you will see some of the interesting results be reported. Okay, that's uh, everything from me. I'm happy to take any question if there is any. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. That's it? Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's it. it. I, I, I want to leave a bit more time so people can ask questions. Yeah, th thanks so much for this uh, really uh, rich uh, presentation. Re really cool result on that uh, reinforcement learning for the prostate uh, use case, right? Because all the, you know, all the studies are always asking is uh, is guided uh, biopsy uh, better than just uh, randomly placing needles? And and your RL is sort of saying that there's that the answer is somewhere in the middle, right? With the lesion size. So I yeah, found that yeah, uh, result I think it's super cool. way, especially when yeah. lesions is small. So so I think it. Now you know, it, it has been a post hoc, but uh, now think about it. It is uh, reasonable when lesion is small. It's targeted biopsy can miss that lesion very easily. Yeah, because you you can't be sure that you you know exactly where it is, right? There's limitation on the no, imaging. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, very uh, intriguing result. Uh, yeah. So we we have quite a few questions here. Uh, so one uh, uh, going back to the surgical <laughs> video application. So what, what are the challenges on transferring between synthetic to real world style for surgical video, right? So you're training, uh, my understanding at least also was that you're training on, on synthetic images, but this is a surgical video, right? It seems much more challenging even than like an x-ray uh, 
you know, generating that artificial. So how, how does that transfer out in the real world when you test that out on, on real surgical videos? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very good question. So uh, short answer is I don't know. And I think it is challenging. And uh, um, a slightly, but we, I think, you know, one of the solution could be you adding more uh, interpretation of the content you want to, to register. So for instance, uh, what NIDA really is working on is trying to, rather than use images directly, you use a segmented version of the images. So although the, trans, the registration becomes, uh, uh, is simulated, but the input is, because it's simulated, there are a lot of masks as an input. So that is very similar to very reliable sort of a prediction because you cool. get the same thing from real world applications. Mm -hmm. So you're taking like all the domain specific part and just turning that into a different task, into a segmentation task and then learning, yeah, learning from that basically. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, you have like eight topics here. This is really cool. So e each question is about something different. Uh, okay, uh, what, what ground truth can be used to validate uh, physics informed neural networks? beyond uh regis final results yeah uh yeah so that's also a very good uh, question so um so if you only consider physics informed your network as a, a forward model so it this is really arguably not my field anymore so that's the mechanics and uh, you know we have colleagues Zeke, for instance who's an expert in that domain and uh, if you want to uh, uh, validated soft tissue especially or, or patient specific uh, models that becomes uh, uh, practically very challenging however if uh, in this particular case the physics is uh, this you know in specifically the solids are used to constrain the deformation the registration is predicting so we only need to re uh, validate registration so the problem becomes how do you validate registration and there's still a bit of challenge there but we use the uh, in this particular case, we use landmarks, et cetera, uh, and the mm -hmm. regions for interest to validate the registration. So arguably, even if the physics is wrong, so for yeah. instance, you, you end up with a very, if you let the material properties be optimized, you end up with very fluid-like soft tissue, but registration is working well, then probably you shouldn't care. Uh, so, you, so you sort of rely, rely on the, the physicists or the mechanical engineering researchers to get, okay, give me, you know, your, your best guess at the right physical model exactly. for this system. And then, okay, let's uh, see. So then, yeah. So you still need yeah. to annotate with landmarks, uh, right? You, you need to create or, or, yeah, yeah. data that, yeah, you need a, uh, yeah, uh, human uh, uh, created ground truth. Uh, okay, one more, let's see. Uh, is meta learning more data hungry than regular learning? And is there enough data in medical use cases to do this? <laughs> so because that's, right, you got a test set that's now turning into a training set. So you would think you would need more data. Is is that really the case? Um, it's it's a very com it's a very complex problem, really, especially in our field. I think it's a very application dependent, uh, and uh, we I, I'm also gonna sort of chase down a bit, uh, you know, are you talking about a training data set or talking about validation data set? Arguably, validation data set uh, requirement for the validation or test data set is the same for any application, any method. So, uh, you know, it will be, it needs to be enough to address your, the question you are, you are asking. For training, again, it depends. Are you trying to show a benefit is just uh, compared to using registration as uh, the meta registration as an example. If you're just trying to show the benefit of using meta learning, comparing to without using meta learning, in our case, we didn't add any data. We are able to show that difference. Now, whether this is the optimum performance, probably not. So yeah, so it's a bit diplomatic answer, but that's what we know so far. Uh, quite Quite complex. Uh, let's see, uh, I think we'll, we'll do one more. Uh, so this question is specific to determining image quality and segmentation. This becomes very challenging with different makes of ultrasound and different parameters uh, uh, and skill of the user. Uh, so uh, what, what, uh, what specifically are you uh, doing to, to address this? 
right? Yeah, so I think it's quality, right? So you got a bunch of devices and they each look different and different users. So yeah, how to adjust yeah, so, that quickly. So, so uh, I gave a talk, uh, uh, I think last month in, at the Imperial and uh, my talk's title, title then is called Task Supervised Machine Learning. So essentially is uh, trying to address problems as such. We know there are, you know, distribution drift between different types of data, data from different places. That's why we should be very clear what our task is and use that task in this particular case. Segmentation, you have to be used in this hospital. We use, we acquire a bit of data from there. You need that for validation anyway, and use that to refine your model, uh, uh, get them involved in training in the first place using the performance of that to supervise your model. So that hopefully will, will solve a bit of a problem rather than just uh, having a model and mm -hmm. hoping it will work anywhere. So yeah, so you think it's it's going to continue to be important to, to adapt these solutions to, to specific sites even, uh, to specific uh, devices, right? To have some sort of a maintenance of a, I guess that's maybe, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, a more wider question, you know, the, right, so deployment of, of AI, right, in, in clinical settings and these interventional use cases, right, is, is it going to be one size fits all or, or is it really going yeah. to be, there's going to be a, you know, a local model or whatever, maybe some federated retraining or, or something that's maybe going to even have a service, you know, I mean, you, you go to a, a, a lecture by Intuitive and they talk about the <laughs> But they also talk about a lot about the services they provide to the to particular hospitals. So we'll we'll give you this service. We'll do a, a project for you and show you with our ML, show you how you can become more efficient, right? But it's custom to a to a specific site, right? Because each each hospital has its own workflow. Uh, so yeah, maybe a general, you know, what's your general yeah, view? So my, one size fits all versus uh, site my current, Yeah, my current uh, uh, thinking is. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to change it, to, you know, in five or ten years. But but now I I'm, I firmly believe that a local adaptation is needed if you want to deploy anything uh, clinically useful. Uh, because most of the application I've been looking at now is uh, the data requirement. We are even we don't even know the limit to it. Now there are particular some some specific applications, for instance, X-rays. They just have millions of millions of data. Oh, there yeah. might be more than one size fits all, but for most of specialized clinical applications, yeah. it's just not the case. Uh, at UCL, we probably have most prostate imaging in the UK, but I still don't think we've got, we've got enough to train a model that can generalize to everywhere else. So, mm -hmm. so our current worker is really trying to reduce the effort and the burden at local that local adaptation. So for instance, we are looking at a few short learnings. You only need a number of examples yeah, from that yeah. local center trying to adapt to your model so your model will be useful. Mm -hmm. I'm, I firmly believe that now, but yeah. you know, prove me wrong. <laughs> yeah, we believe many things five years ago that now, uh, yeah, now yeah, yeah. technology has made all these leaps. So, so who knows? Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, but the, the data is, is totally the key in medical, right? We're in, in, a, in a different world than uh, our colleagues from the, you know, who scraped all the internet to train their models. Yeah, yeah definitely. All right. Thank you very much, Yipeng. Uh, really appreciate uh, your uh, joining this, uh, 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 providing this uh, lecture today to our audience. Uh, I think these are really uh, the, the things that we're interested in at my company, but also, uh, you know, uh, the, the people who, who, I, who I saw here uh, uh, from the industry, I think this is really uh, something of interest uh, in a wide way. So uh, thank you very much and have a good evening. Uh, we'll let you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Th thank you for having me. Thank, th thank you everyone for listening. Yeah, if thank any you. other follow-up question, I'm happy, just email me. Uh, I'm always happy going into details of those uh, research projects. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Thank and you. the video uh, la last point, the video will be up uh, also in in a few days probably, so we'll share that as well for those who registered and could not attend. There are quite a few of those people as well. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye everyone.